Welcome to a, another episode of Scientology Outside of the Church podcast, season five, episode two. I'm Jonathan Burke here again with Jason Roba. Jason, how are you this afternoon? Or actually, this morning. <laughs> uh, my evening, your morning. Right. Yeah, doing pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, nice to be back on another podcast again. We're going to be cranking out these uh, season five ones pretty nicely here, it sounds like. So excited to be doing yeah. another one. Ow. Yeah, me too. Well, this one is going to be about an interesting an interesting subject and it's a successful action that we've had here at AOGP for a long time uh, and that is how do you present independent Scientology to somebody who doesn't know anything about it and doesn't have reality one about the subject so we're gonna go off in a couple of different directions on this and explain this and how this is. And I think people will really be fascinated by this because this is one of these things that anybody can do. You don't have to have a crib sheet. You don't have to have a, uh, you know, really know much about it. It, it, it can tell you a lot. And, and there's a lot of indexes in it to know what's going on in a person's life. And then we'll also get into the, the personality tests or um, the Oxford, uh, the Oxford, what is it? OCA, Oxford Capacity Analysis. That's, sorry, I had a brain fart there. Uh, also, and, and what that has to do with this. So to start off with, and feel free to fire, interject, and you know, okay. uh, say anything you want about whatever when I say this. Is start yeah. off with, let, let's get, get your side of the story as a, as a trained auditor. How would you go about explaining Scientology to somebody in three paragraphs or less, go. Right. So yeah, th this is a, an interesting one because I do come across this uh, in casual conversation with people where I want to talk about Scientology, but it's difficult because dropping the Scientology word to the public can be a little <laughs> bit of a reality break. You know, it can be yeah. real out reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it, that that which shall not be named, almost given given the bad. Yeah. Um, reputation that um Ms. Cavage has has given it over the last couple of decades right yeah it, it's it's almost as touchy as telling someone you're i don't know i don't know i could use some other analogies there but but there's some other words that you could put in there of uh, previous groups and, and trying to say that you're one of them but uh so it, it is something <laughs> it's something i've had to, to to talk about without um saying what scientology is directly and you usually Usually I just describe it as a process of learning how to learn and mm -hmm. knowing how to know. And usually I say it in mm -hmm. more words than that, but I always try to put learning how to learn, learning how to know, or knowing how to know and uh, knowing oneself. Um, it would be a heuristic or a, um, uh, it would be a way of, of learning something that is self-evident, um, and here I am saying a lot of ums with it, but it is, it is something challenging <laughs> to talk about without just with talk, without talking about the Scientological terms. Well, it, 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 it does put you on your back heel quite a bit when, when, when it, when it comes up and your, your heart rate increases and you get a little nervous, like the teacher, when they would say, okay, kids, we're going to have a pop quiz. Right. I mean, I mean, even, even from a, a seasoned person such as myself. It, it, it used to be that way. And I would go out of my way and say, um, I'm a life coach. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd say, yeah. well, you know, what, do, what do you do? Well, no. type of thing. And I, and I do still do that given, given, depending on where I'm at, you know, as yeah. far as the, that goes, but as I've developed this and in part, and it comes directly from the, the briefing course where LRH mentions this, but there's a much simpler way to do this than, and it's, it's, it's a demo. It's a demonstration. Yeah. You could almost call it an assist in a, in a lot of ways. So what Ellery says is, is he says, get the person to recall a pleasure moment. I tend to get people to try and remember the most pleasurable moment they ever had. Now, the reason for this is, you're doing a recall action or process with the person and you're trying to get them to think of something that is not 
an engram, a secondary, or a lock. Obviously, you're not trying to take them in session on Dianetics. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get them to remember a pleasurable moment. And I typically say something like the uh, first time you went to Disneyland or an amusement park or your best birthday ever, or, you know, the first time you went parasailing and you, and you caught the wind, whatever. Um, and most people, and we talked about this yesterday, was it yesterday, day before yeah. yesterday, we were talking, we we're talking about calm legs. Yeah. Now, it's interesting to note LRH says a lot about a communication lag and a communication lag is as follows. When you ask a person, what color is the sky? Long pause. They look at you kind of funny. They look at the sky. They look back at you and they go, well, what do you mean? That's an example of a calm lag. Now, you might ask somebody else, depending on where they're at on the tone scale, and you, and you say, well, what color is the sky? And they go, it's blue. That's a calm lag as well. The, the latter is a long calm lag, and the former is a very short calm lag. No. So this, this is an index. Right out of the gate, what do you know? You've asked the person to recall a, a pleasurable moment. And some people might ask you three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions before they actually answer your question. So right there, you've got a long calm lag because they're trying to duplicate what it is that you're saying. So you, that's, that's your first indication of what you're dealing with. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be judgmental or anything like that. From an auditor standpoint, you're just trying to get data on what this person's universe, their, their reactive mind, their case is like. So then once they finally say, oh, okay. And you'll get other people uh, that instantly go blam and they don't ask you any questions or anything. And they go, well, it's this, that's great. When that happens, now you're, now you're really cooking with, with gas when that happens. So the way this works is they tell you about a pleasurable moment and you try and get as much information from them as you can. And then they might tell you what the circumstance was and you have to prod them and pull a little bit more and then say, okay, yeah, what else? What else do you see? Okay. 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 And then you get more data and then they might say, they might start off with, well, I see my mom, my dad, uh, I see my, my three brothers and my sister and we're all at Yosemite um, down in the Valley. Okay. That, that works too. Then what you do is make sure you acknowledge them, and then you say, "Okay, so what else do you see?" You don't you want to you don't want to give them any leading questions. You get as much data as possible, and if they don't give you the answer that you're looking for, you say, "Okay, so where's the camera? Where do you see this from?" And they go, "What do you mean?" Ninety five percent of them will give you that calm, like, "Well, what do you mean?" Now this is where it gets really interesting is because when you do that, what you're doing is you're getting them to look at something that they've probably taken for granted their entire lifetime. Now, to our listeners, I'm sure that they're going through this right now with us going, oh, yeah, and, and <laughs> probably more, more than not are already independent Scientologists. But it's still, it's still something that people don't realize. And that is, is that when you ask the person what it is that you see, that they go, Okay, um, well, I see myself and I see my mom, my dad, my three brothers, and wait a minute, I see myself. Yeah. And that's when, you, that's when you jump back into the deep end of the pool and you go, that's right. That's you as a spirit or as a Thetan, depending on whichever they can have easier. You say, that's what Scientology addresses, is it addresses you. And, that, and that's how... You broach the subject. Now, there's an interesting caveat here to this. And this is where we'll, we'll take a little bit of a right turn into the personality test land. And that is, if they say to you, well, um, well, I see all of these things, my mom, my dad, my three brothers, and my sister, and we're in Yosemite, I see it from my own eyes. Well, then you ask them for another incident. Pleasurable and try and get that data again and get them to find an incident where they can see themselves exterior to the body. 
Now, if they don't, and you try this several times, you now know, and this is where we can get into another side rail, is being a potential trouble source and either being in the vicinity of a suppressive personality or around somebody who reminds you of one in the past. Right. Because what happens is, is when that person doesn't see from a three feet behind their head or off to the side or even, you know, half a mile and they can see themselves depending on how keyed out they are, they are a potential trouble source. Right. Now where this goes over to in the OCA is the D column, the D column, if it's plus 32, okay, will say this person is not PTS. When a person says that to you, at least at that time, if they took the test, they were being suppressed. So their D column would be low. Now, what that means is, is they're out of valence when they're suppressed. And this is what happens when a person gets sick. All PTS, this being a potential trouble source, when somebody is sick, they are PTS. So now you have an index of calm lag. You have an index of, are they PTS at that time? If you ask them three or more of these and they all come up the same where they're seeing it through the body's eyes, you know that they're probably being suppressed in present time. Yeah. So that's a really neat tool that you can go out and you can use to tell somebody about independent Scientology and get them to understand. And this goes back to, you know, that we're not all just part of the universe, which we covered in our last podcast, but they are an individual viewpoint with anchor points at that time and are now, and you can tell them, well, you can think about anything when you, when you had breakfast yesterday and they'll look back at it and go, Oh my gosh, I see myself eating breakfast. I was at Denny's and I had the grand slam. You know, that type of thing. <laughs> and yeah. so it's a really neat tool to use. And then it opens the door either way, whether it has to do with suppression, because if that's going to be real to them when you talk to them. Now, this takes us to the next tool, the 10 August HCOB. Now, you familiar? I, yeah, I was going to say, before we, we go on to that, ask you a question about the, the previous thing we're just on. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you were you were talking about um, having the person recall from an exterior point of view, and you said about uh, them being suppressed. Is it at the moment of recall they're being suppressed, or at that moment in that incident, uh, that pleasure moment? So if somebody's recalling it and they're looking at it through the uh, first person perspective, like a first person shooter in a video game, that right. means that at, at that moment when they're recalling the incident, they're mm. they're PTS. Yeah, because you'll okay. generally you'll generally find. Yeah. If if you dig long enough, and I mean, it gets to be a little bit laborious after about three tries, but you'll generally find an incident where they aren't suppressed it, and it'll, as you come forward, it, but it just depends. So you could find that all of them are that way, or it's just one, depending on the time, but it's always at that time. That doesn't mean that they're suppressed now, okay. but it does lean them in the direction of going again, type one. PTS, you know, or excuse me, type two PTS, because it's, it's somebody in their past, but they're PTS to somebody in their present who reminds them of somebody in the past. Right. And you know, it's not the end of the world, but it tells you on their OCA that they, they can and do go out of valence. And when the, and like Gellerate says, the only thing an auditor needs to know is that low on the left means that they're out of valence low on the right on the personality test means they're insane or to a degree thereof. Yeah. Generally, when somebody's really PTS, they're low on the left and low on the right. And then they end up being, a lot of times they end up being a Matterhorn, which is a, a, a high, high D area. Yeah. And that's that, the, those are the people you really got to watch out for. And a Matterhorn, what, what, what's, what's the uh, case, case characteristic of someone who's a Matterhorn? They're very, very surf acky and they're always right. Oh, okay. Okay. So they're using their they're they're using their engrams or some of them as a means to make themselves right and others wrong, aid their ability to survive and hinder that of others, so on and so forth. Yeah. So, and and you know that's part and parcel to PTSness as well, because yeah, and like we mentioned, PTSness. If you if you're PTS, if you're sick, you're PTS. Okay, so if you're using engrams to get your way 
what does that tell you? Well, those engrams are going to include sickness, which means they're PTS at the time. And we can get into, get into that a little bit later. We can do the whole hierarchy uh, for the sake of the, the, the podcast for yeah. people so that they, they understand it maybe if, if yeah. we have time. I think people will find that very interesting. Yeah. So the the uh, 10 August HCOB is one of the easiest things that a person can use for somebody who is is feeling ill or sick. And what LRH recommends in that is is that uh, let's say uh, S- Sally has a severe bronchitis and she's really under the weather and she's bedridden. So you go into Sally and you say. So tell me how it is you're feeling right now. What are the symptoms? What are the somatics? Sally gives you a, a, a litany of things, burning in the lungs, throat, coughing, hurts to breathe, all that. You say, okay, good. So tell me the first time you had this particular illness. Generally, there'll be several of them. And then you say, okay, good. That's the earliest. Yeah, it is. Okay, good. Who was suppressing you at that time? Right. So what you, what you're doing is you're getting them to look at who was keeping them down at the time, and then the mass will blow on that, and you'll find that they get better. Yeah. It's that simple. I, I I can't tell you the number of times I've done that with somebody, and the look of amazement on, on their face. It's, it's, it's almost as just a black cloud just lifts from them. And they're like, oh, it was this. And don't be surprised. To, and, and you almost have to tell them to say, just tell me whatever comes up, whatever picture, whatever significance, don't invalidate it. Don't evaluate it. You're not going to make me think you're crazy or anything. Just tell me what it is. And when you do that, they will oftentimes go past life. On, on this illness mm-hmm. and um, one of the people that i did it with they actually came up with a pirate incident where they've okay. been buried in the sand up to their neck and left left to die at at with the tide coming in yeah wow <laughs> and, the, and the salt was burning their throat and all this stuff it was it was really cool and i did ask me do you mind if i share this yeah yeah it's fine so uh, that's one of the 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 best ways that you can introduce somebody to Scientology to somebody who is sick. It's right. so easy and it doesn't require a cheat sheet. It's just that easy. And it works like gangbusters Wait. because you're, you're unburdening the case tremendously by getting them to spot whoever it was that is being stimulated in present time. That's making them sick now to times that they were sick in the past. You're basically running the engram back to basic. Wait, that's hey? how simple it is. It's just yeah, simple. Most of the time that's fast track. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So those are two great ways, sick and unsick, that you can introduce independent Scientology to somebody and and open a door to a lot more conversation and, and pique their interest because it then becomes very real to the person that this stuff works. When you blow their mind like that with the simple technology. And all of Scientology and Dianetics is, is ridiculously simple. The, the, the most powerful things we have are so simple, and that's the beauty of it is its simplicity. Right. These are two of the best methods I know to do that. Yeah, and that, that's always the, the misconception. People always have an idea that it's something terribly complicated, <laughs> but, you know, because of what they heard on TV and South Park and everything, and it's just, yeah. 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 I mean, it's just dead easy stuff. But the thing is, is that people don't, if they don't understand it, know that these things are there, they're right in front of them. Everybody has these things. Maybe. You just, have, all you are is the doorman opening the door to the, the high rise apartment building. How high up would you like to go in awareness? Right. It's the so, uh, instruction manual for life that we all talk about that we wish we were born with an instruction. I'm going to give any instructions for life. This is a yeah. very effective instruction manual. Yeah, it yeah. is. And it's a lot of it is not so common, common sense. Right. <clears throat> yeah, who was it? It was Red Sharp that wrote the book based on Dianetics and Scientology called This is Life, right? Mm-hmm. I think that was that's Red right. Sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, 
the instruction manual that we all, everybody colloquially talks about, you know, nobody ever wrote one. And then when people start looking at this, it's like, it is there, there's, there's the mechanics of, of livingness, the mechanics of, of thinkingness and, you know, thought, emotion, and effort, all of it. Right. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, LRH was able to figure this stuff out and distill it down and put it in a way that people could easily understand. Um, and another interest, another interesting little anecdote that most people probably don't know that you can, if you're talking to somebody that's done Dianetics and they're, they're talking to you about uh, the analytical mind and the reactive mind and all this stuff, 1961, uh, August, I believe, on the briefing course, LRH says rather almost, you know, just as an aside, he's, he's lighting a cigarette and, and um, you can hear his lighter close. And he just says, well, you know, back in the day of Dianetics, we didn't know what the analytical mind is, but the analytical mind is the Thetan. Right. And, you know, I mean, you just these little bits and you go, oh, shit. Yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. sense. It's not this other thing. And that's that's something that I've run into with people with Dianetics is they think, you know, well, where does the analytical mind fit in with the Thetan? Well, they're, they're one and the same. But it's not something that made it into any of the books right. for some reason. And there's, yeah. you know, the, the, the lectures are full of these crazy little gems of information that, that, you know, they're like the fibrous tissue that connects everything together yeah. to make it work you just you don't know where to look anyway and that's part of the reason why we, we're doing the, the the oracle project in ai is to find all of these little connectors and synapses that put all these things together that nobody ever had the time to do and when you have ai all of these things can be related and put into a certain I think it's what they call it a pigeon a pigeonhole yeah, and yeah. and that's the way that the database the 3d database is set up and it makes it so much easier to understand a lot of this stuff otherwise you're kind of left with these micro questions on how do you do this and how do you do that right yeah just anything like you want to with, interject oh i was gonna say just like what you're saying with the uh uh philadelphia doctorate course lecture series and 8808 you know, he says that book will not make very much sense without these lectures. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's basically the user's manual to that set of lectures. Okay. And, um, I was speaking to one of our students who knew a guy who was there Lot up. at the original PD and he lives in Philadelphia, actually yeah. one of our, our student does. And he met, he spoke to this guy and he, he said, <laughs> and this made me it made me feel a lot better he said the 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 people that were there it was it was a small group of people <laughs> and and when they were there at the congress they they were so blown away by it they were just like what in the world did i just witness this is ni 1952 everybody everybody had those who could afford it, a black and white TV, you know mm -hmm. I mean? And it wasn't a great picture type of a thing. And, and he's going so far above everybody's head with this technology that they, they don't, they just don't know what to think about it. Then these people were walking out, just having to go. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't have but one copy of the tape at the time they recorded and tape was crazy expensive back then right the yeah. machine was crazy expensive i mean that was a luxury we are so lucky that those got recorded but this was so very early on now just just to mention this this is something that goes along with that uh and this kind of is where at this point in time on the philadelphia doctorate course uh in the milestone one lectures what happened you know People say, well, you know, it was Dianetics, Dianetics, and all of a sudden it was Scientology. Scientology, Scientology, Scientology until the late 60s, and then it was Dianetics again in the early to mid 70s. And the reason for this is, is that, and I don't know, I don't know if you know this or not, you may, because you're you're pretty up to date on the early history of, of Scientology and Dianetics, you know, the Jack Parsons stuff and all that. Yeah. 
what happened is, is that LRH lost the rights to book one while he was in Wichita one. and to the, the board of directors of, of the original Dianetics organization. And so LRH was like, well, you know, fuck them if they can't take a joke. All I can right. do it once, I can do it again. And he had right. already seen a lot of these things. And the reason why I bring this up is one of the things that, that he realized was what we were talking about a few minutes ago, seeing yourself three feet in back of your head. Well, this is what gave him the cue to start Scientology. And it was Mary Sue who came up with the word Scientology, which was, and feel free to add in on this. You probably know more about this than I do was the original it was originally a german book and it was scientology with an ie not a y right. and so they made it a y and there you go because that put it right right in and there's probably ie just because it was german it had- you know it's, it's still latin wise knowing how to know and all this stuff so what he did is he went ahead and started writing science of survival which is known lovingly as book two and you know the 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 other the other dianetics books and everything like that but this is where the the split came and then right around that time period we also had matheson showing up on the scene with the the original uh, e-meter the size of a bread box right and tubes and all of that stuff and then he got into history of man and right. then that's when that's really got interesting. Yeah, that's where we get everything from the uh, Milestone One series, right? Where it basically yeah. sums up all the upper level stuff, but uh, before it is ever codified in the LT levels, right? Yeah, and that's that's the funny thing is you look back on this and you go, I can't believe they published this stuff. If right. you know about if you know about that data, you're like, shut what? the front door. <laughs> right. yeah. How how in the hell did this make it? But the thing is, is if if people don't know about that stuff, which they shouldn't, you shouldn't know about that stuff ahead of time. But if you've done it and you look at it, you go, oh man! And there are so many great pieces of data in there, and I I wish I had more information on why that data sat dormant on ice for so long mm-hmm. between then and at right towards the briefing course. And I'm sure he was aware of it, but you know, if it weren't for the meter, we wouldn't have been able to, to prove that out. And to a certain degree, the meter provides the confirmation bias in the physical universe. Take look. And for our listeners, it is a, a confirmation bias, which we also did a uh, podcast on, is where you're looking for some sort of physical universe indication, like you're a scientist and you say, this chemical reaction happened and this proves that so-and-so and so-and-so happens. And this means you know that type of thing. That's confirmation bias. Now, as you go up the bridge and you get up the OT levels, I- I'll be perfectly honest, I've fallen prey to it many, many times where didn't quite trust myself on, on something that I perceived ahead of time and, and had to wait and see that if it proved out. And sometimes it would be weeks or days or hours, just depending on what it was. But anyway, this is one of those things where the e-meter was used to find these entities, so to speak. Uh, and, and this is where, there. yeah, yeah. And I, this is, this is where the ball really got rolling because it was a whole area that was untapped. And the nice thing about Dianetics is, is Dianetics is this neat little activity that's all tied up in a bow and it's, it's not hard to do. And it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to screw it up. Mm-hmm. Even on, yeah. even the worst auditor can still get gains with it. And then Scientology has a much broader angle of view. And this kind of makes a nice segue uh, to what we were talking about briefly for a moment of all the things that Scientology consists of, which includes the Thetan themselves. And that's that's what Scientology is, is about, is that's you. That's the person three feet behind the body's head. 
But the thing is, is you have to bring a person up to an awareness of that. And the more charge you pull off of the case, which the E-meter is your your gauge for that, is to the degree that the person's awareness increases. And the more and more you do that, the more they become aware and perceive, so on and so forth, to where they pop out of the physical universe, and they pop out of the body, and they go, I'm not my body, and I'm not in the physical universe, and I'm not part, part of the physical universe, I'm not part of the the group collective and the simplicity of that is wait for it misunderstood words yep misunderstood words and this is something that misunderstood words and i'll i'll, I'll add a little sidebar to that wrong dates mm-hmm. wrong locations now yep. These are the things that stick a thetan. And this is something LRH found out. Well, he didn't didn't codify it in an actual reference, but he did codify it in the Scientology and the Dianetic Axioms. It's to uh, Dianetic Axiom 38, time, place, form, and event, which is the same thing as OW write-ups over its mm-hmm. and withholds, interestingly enough. And that is to get any sort of an as isness in auditing, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the person to spot the exact time, place, form, and event of something instead of whatever it is that they're creating on top of it that turns it into mm-hmm. Paisley instead of Plaid. So that's really, really interesting when you look at misunderstood words because misunderstood words are what cause a person to individuate and pull away from an area that's what we call a withhold and a withhold can be missed somebody nearly finds out about something that you did and then you get really really upset with them or somebody else gets really really upset with you but it all comes down to this fundamental of misunderstood words this is where knowing how to know comes in well now that wasn't just, and LRH didn't put that in, into the the briefing course. The student hat course didn't exist until 1967, 1968. So 1950 to 1967, there weren't, the books didn't have a, make sure you clear all your words while you read this book. Well, yeah, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it wasn't something that we were aware of. And this, the, the, a lot of the study tech, and I know there are other people that know a lot more about the, t- the time, place, form, and event okay. <laughs> uh, about the whole thing, but it was a husband and wife couple that pre- that were, came up with a lot of this study tech data in mm-hmm. LRH, to my understanding, got their approval to use it. And he took it and boiled it down and distilled it into what would become the study tech because once he got it on the meter, that answered up a whole slew of other things as to right. well misunder misunderstood words guess what read on the meter you know Ooh, this like, i know this yeah. as solo auditor mm-hmm. and they read like gangbusters if you don't understand something yep now, now the other interesting thing is they didn't know what a floating needle was until 1964 we've talked about that before yep. i think but, yep you know so you know all, it, it's a work in progress scientology was at that time and and the, these discoveries were made but you start out with misunderstood words misunderstood words lead to overts and withholds overts and withholds lead to motivators motivators lead to engrams because an engram is a is a motivator which and a motivator for our listeners that don't know what that is is where you've committed an over and now you're looking for reasons to get back at somebody right you actually Believe it or not, folks, you actually pull in your, your own motivators. You create this. Even, even in your supposed lowly state as a being, you create these motivators and you crave them to the degree that you pull them in. Those are engrams. Then you take those engrams and you turn them into service facsimiles. And service facsimiles and engrams are go hand in hand with evil purposes. So that's the matter, Orin, with the uh, high on the right and high on the left? Uh, low on the left, low on the right, high in the middle. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, and we see, we see an 
awful lot of Matterhorns <laughs> on the on the OCA. Well, awful lot, uh, and it's 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 very very common. And you know, a Matterhorn is is somebody who blows up really easy. You know, they're a powder keg, and and part of that is because of the mist withhold phenomena and the and the misunderstood words that lie below that. Well, well, so you know, there are a lot of different angles that you can you can take to get somebody into Scientology to kind of turn this all the way back around. You can sit down and you can clear up words that they don't understand and you can approach it from that wise you can have them sit down and and uh if they're if if they're a lower d do the the 10 august with them you can do dianetics with them you can do well there's the drug route the purif and and all of that too you know where you can do objectives with them and, and you know certain aspects of scientology don't work well on certain cases if they are uh low on the tone scale for example so you have th that's really the first thing is you need to be able to upnose as elorate says observe the obvious and look at the person and go okay what am i dealing with here where are they at on the tone scale and the tone scale is by far the best tool we have alongside the chart of human ability absolutely o so over to you since i've been stealing the mic here yeah. for 40 minutes so I was going to ask, okay, so we're, we're talking about Wildstone 1, which is probably my favorite lecture series, and mm -hmm. how it, everything came up, what History of Man, what to audit was 1953, or somewhere 52, right there, 52, yeah. 53, somewhere in there. Those lectures themselves were, I think, in, in fall of 52, right? I want to say, like, there's mm -hmm. November, December. Yeah, sounds right. So, sounds right. Yeah. And then, okay, so the OT levels start getting developed, what, in 10 years later, right, about 1963, I want to say. Is that what he, he does? OT? He started. He started running into a lot of the those aspects. Sixty two, sixty three, with mm -hmm. goals, goals, mass auditing, okay. goals, problems, so mass on GPMs. So ten years in there. So I, I'm curious. Yeah, it, we, we've talked about maybe that stuff was mothballed a little bit, or is there anything in the blue volumes? The uh, what are those? The research and development. Volumes there. They uh, I haven't ever read any of those before, but I've seen them around floating around out there. Well, all the R all the R and D volumes are is they are a running record of every lecture LRH supposedly ever gave. I'm going to and that and from that that goes all the way from the Oakland lecture series, which was August of 1950 uh, forward. And I don't having not been in the church for 19 years. I know that they publish an image with R the R and D volumes. There are new R and D volumes in them because the for those those people who are uninitiated in this, what the church has to do is roughly about every twenty years they have to republish books because they lose the copyright to the books, and this is part of the reason why we have a problem with the church, one of many. Uh, is that they keep altering the books in order to get a new copyright on the book. But what happens is, is that really the only thing that is copyrightable, if you had, you had a, a stanza in a book that said, see Dick and Jane run. And then they put in there, see Dick and Jane run through the grass on a hot day. Through the grass on a hot day would be the only thing that would be copyrightable. So they, they keep making these changes and it's sort of like that, uh, uh, <laughs> that scene in uh, history of the world part one, where the guy shots down the hallway of the castle mm -hmm. and he goes, you know, shut the front door, shut the front door, shut right. the front door. Well, you know, it gets changed as it goes on to where it becomes shut the back door or something like yeah. that. Well, that's what's happened with a lot of the books in the church. Yeah, so maybe. the church has to publish these books every 20 years. And the first set of R and D volumes only got up to volume 13. Man. Okay. And that was only until like 1953, 1954, however, was by far the most productive year in lectures for LRH. He did almost a lecture a day in 1954. I, I would know because I, I had to, to deal with all of those lectures. And I'm putting them up and everything like that. I spent a lot of time in there and it is unbelievable how many lectures Ellery did. He did almost 5,000 lectures 
over the course of 19, late 1950 to 1975. Most of the lectures occurred and ended right around 1967 when, when the heat got turned up on him for publishing the OT levels. So that 5,000 lectures is a lot, wow. plus all of the tech that he wrote. And an, interest, an interesting side note again is that what he was doing is that he was basically going out on a road show to every country that spoke English. He did, the, did, lectures, did lectures in the US, he did lectures in England, he did lectures in South Africa, and he did lectures in Australia. You'll never see a lecture where he went to Vietnam or Japan or China or the Middle East or Germany. And he's a very, very savvy guy in that wise because he, he, he went to the areas where he knew that he could lecture and they would understand him. I mean, you, you can't sit up, stand up there and talk in English and they speak French. So it was a traveling roadshow for basically 10, almost 11 years. He kind of slowed down in 59. Um, and I, I think what happened is, is the way that it appears at least is that by that time, he was like, you know what? I got kids. I need to settle down. We need to raise the kids. Why don't we get a house, Mary Sue? And that's what they did. And why don't we have them come to us? And that's what yeah. happened with the St. Hill Special Briefing Course. But all, all the while, while he's doing all of this, and, and, and especially in the beginning, a lot of the early books, the the like you mentioned earlier, these like 8008, 8, these books were the textbook for the lecture series he would write a book on top of lecturing there's like almost 80 ish lectures in the pdcs and he wrote a book and as the lectures picked up and he had more people and things started to get bigger and bigger and bigger he stopped writing the books because he'd gotten the basics down and he was trying to find a better route still even though it was scientology and this is interesting it's a better route to clear and then, well, eventually, long a long story short, they couldn't do it on the briefing course because it was it was a pilot type of a thing that they were doing with all of these methodologies, and it was found that it was too difficult to train people to do listing and nulling and 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 both as a PC and as an auditor, and so he decided, okay, let's look at the basics, and he started going back to he'd already gotten the, the OT level data with the clearing course. So the clearing course is very popular from roughly 65, 66, all the way up to about 71. And then he segued back over to Dianetics, standard Dianetics. And then we had uh, Dianetics Today, which caused the huge boom in, in the 70s because it was basically a course check sheet and all of its references in one book that you could stick in a backpack and you could go audit anybody with a mark five meter and make it clear in, in 100, well, 150 hours well, then have them do their scientology grades so he was trying to simplify 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 using the basics and you know eventually that's what he did but the thing that a lot of people miss is that when they listen to these older lectures you have to listen to these lectures within the context of the time period that they took place Otherwise, it gets very, very confusing when you start hearing about theta clear, mess clear, clear. And you're like, well, I want to be that. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that all of those clears are all of the same thing. It's just what it looked like at that time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Makes sense. There we are. Anyway, this is a great podcast to give to people to get a better understanding from the 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 macro to the micro on, on how all of this stuff works in independent Scientology in, in that there's tons of lectures and you have to look at them from the context when they were said uh, and that even book one will make it clear Scientology will make it clear book one takes a really long time to make it clear but you can do it and that you can introduce people from a lot of different angles into the subject and tell them pick a subject okay let's see what he had to say about that and you know um chances are he had something to say about it uh, when i was at flag in 88 uh, and i went to the mimeo files there are file cabinet after file cabinet after file cabinet i don't know if they still exist because i've heard they burned a lot of stuff a lot of 
Uh, but there were policies that he wrote on how to handle the plants in the garden at St. Hill and how to do a tune-up on any car. I saw them with my own eyes and they've never made it out into public view. Wow. And it, it's a, a crying shame, not just be, I mean, you know, of course we know how to do tune-ups and you know how to plant flowers, but from his viewpoint and the way that he writes and that distilled viewpoint, it would really yeah. be great to see that sort of a thing because he was a very multifaceted individual and, Basically, what LRH did with Dianetics and Scientology is he wrote, and when I say wrote, I mean like a writer, he wrote himself out of the physical universe by applying the power to change formula. He wrote up the hat on how to do something and got it out of his space and his universe, which cleared up a lot of bypass charge. And anybody can do that with anything, anything that they've discovered. And that that alone can make a person a clear if they do it well enough well, they, that's how he came to rise above the bank and he mentions that in keeping scientology working number one you know it's not don't basically don't ask why or how I was able to rise above the bank well that's because he wrote up his hats when he discovered something he put it down there and then he moved on and that way it was in writing in the physical universe and out of his universe and into the physical universe and that creates an as isness yeah that makes sense then why the the individual who who takes on everything as their responsibility and kind of makes themselves an only one by, by doing yeah. everything for everyone. And they, they end up pulling more masses. Well, right. <laughs> right. And the, and the, and the thing is, is that your alter is when you have to explain it to somebody again and again and again and again, and what happens when you alter is something is that it causes it to persist. So yep. when somebody, when you, when you discover something and you, you have something to say that it's of importance, write it down, make a video of it, both, and then that way, when somebody asks about it, you can show them and have them see it. And one, it doesn't take time off of your life other than check out my video or check out this reference. I'll send it to you and it's done. Yeah. And then you can move on because, I mean, you think about it, how many times have you explained one thing to somebody in, yeah. in your life? I'm sure there's one that's at the top of the list, whatever it is, there's something you've explained to people over and over and over and over again. And it's probably Scientology well, for some people. And you don't have to do that. The, he did it for us. It's just, you have to know what these references are. How do you explain Scientology to somebody? We, we just gave you the roadmap out based off of what he said, and it was turned into a lecture and it was written down. I learned it and then I imparted it to other people, yourself included, well, and anybody can use it. So use it. Well, yeah, so that's amazing. So it's literally like Ron Hubbard took the textbook, the instruction manual for life and put it out there for everybody. And there, this scope, this is something I was thinking about over the weekend. So we would our last podcast. The scope that the Scientology and Dianetics technology and everything that Hubbard developed is something that could literally be used to run a civilization. If you had a template to run a civilization, to run planets, to run star systems, this would be the way to do it. If there were one philosophy that would be on the scope of being able to run a fourth dynamic or multiple fourth dynamics, this is the only one that's been written that we have record for. I'm sure other ones exist on Voltrack where people had a philosophy that, that everybody tuned into on different planets. But this is the first one we've had in this iteration of civilization. Right. And that's, that's a revolutionary act to some civilizations, suppressing right. civilizations. And that's why to kind of bring it full circle. That is why Scientology was attacked on this planet. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Period. There's no more I can say about that. One plus one equals two. This is how this, this happened is, is if you've got somebody who's saying, look, this is how you can free beings and this is how you can run a civilization. There's the thing called an org board. we got the data series. You set up an ideal scene. You figure out the departure from the ideal scene. Boom. Okay. Yep. You can, you can hat anybody with the Asto series. I mean, he, I mean, you just look at the volumes of data that, that he put out there. Now, granted, I understand, you know, he says, he says, you know, you don't want to wear cologne around people because it might re-stimulate them. Yes, that's true. Do I wear cologne? Yes, I do, because I like to wear cologne. But I mean, you know, I look at them. I look at them as you. You should at least be aware of them. And and I'm not going to wear it with a PC when I take a PC in session. 
just just right. to make sure for those those purists out there. But I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, he 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 he's giving you this data to look at and find out if it's true for you. If it's true for you, then use it. If and that uh, and to cap this off as a capstone, the the neat thing about about LRH Scientology and Dianetics is. I've never ever, and I, I think I've said this before, but I've never ever seen where he says, you do this, you get this. I can't think of anything on this planet that comes anywhere close to telling you how to build and run a civilization and free beings and make them happy and put them at, at control of their lives. Anything even remotely close to the data that, that he, he gave us. Great. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. And, and that's why I do what I do. And I love what I do. Right. There's rumors of information and teachings and, and uh, technologies that exist from Atlantis, but there, we, there's there's legends of, oh, well, it shot off into this and it shot off into that and the Freemasons have it this and the Rosicrucians have that. And it's like people talk, there's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of talk about the yeah. way the old world be- existed, but it's just rumors. And then, okay, well, do, where do they apply it? Where can you go and, and get that? Right. Well, and, that, and you know, the- that. <laughs> Yeah, it, that's you know, and that's the thing. Like like Hubbard says, he says, the the surface of planets are fragile things; they don't last forever. And that's what mm-hmm. happened about eleven thousand five hundred years ago during the yep. Younger Dryas period. Is we had a direct hit from a comet in Greenland, mm-hmm. and this is where you get these stories of a wall of water and forty days and nights of rain and all of this stuff is because a large if you weren't above a certain elevation, yep. you you were drowned. And this was a system reset. And this has happened, don't quote me on this, but it's this has happened somewhere in the neighborhood of eleven times in the last hundred thousand years. That's an geologically speaking, that's an awful lot of times for such a short period of time. And that's the thing. That's why it's important. I'm going to take this moment to grandstand. That's why it's important to not dawdle and get this data, live, eat, sleep it, and understand it and duplicate it. Clear your words, help other people with it because the, the, oppor- the window of opportunity is short. If it isn't because of people, it's because of the physical universe itself. And if you aren't living underground in a deep underground base, which they have for this very reason, you you might not get an opportunity to do it. And I beseech you to take this opportunity and get this data for yourself from a guy who really cared about people's futures. So there you have it. I hope this information helps people and we've got it documented with a a lot of neat little tidbits of information and everything on how to present Scientology to the world easily and make it fun. That's right. Let's hope those people down in the deep underground military bases have a copy of book one on their shelves. Otherwise, it'll be (laughs) left to the rest of us or the the rest of the people that might have it. I was just thinking about this too when we're talking about the scope of things that this could be a whole podcast in and of itself, but the idea that if this does exist enough and, you know, like you're saying that the surface of the planet is wiped off, it'll be there within the memory of the beings that, that eventually get bodies again. And it'll be recreated again. It'll take a very, very long time, I would imagine, but it'll, it'll be there. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's amazing what a, what a, a being can recreate and how much they can remember of something. And you right. know, the, the OT levels are a testament of that to, to some what, of the data there that's used to put the, the yoke of suppression around a being's so-called neck is, yeah. you know, if that, if that data can get passed down, so can the good data get passed right. down. And, uh, you know, it's, it's time that we, we say, okay, enough is enough. And we're going to, do something good for the betterment of all, all being kind as, right. as quickly, as quickly as we can. That's my viewpoint. Right. So folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we will catch you again on our next podcast in the next day or two uh, for Jason Roba and myself, Jonathan Burke. Thanks for listening. And we will see you very soon. Bye-bye.